All right, everyone. <clears throat> Another Tuesday reading that we're going to do. Uh, we're talking about African philosophy of education. And in fact, we're talking about the implications of this for teaching and learning. This paper is by Y. Waghid, uh, a professor out of South Africa. The interesting thing about this paper is I, I've had this paper for a little while. And what led me to this paper, in a sense, was an article um, that's similarly titled. Let me see if I could pull up that article. Yeah. This article, African Philosophy of Education, a Powerful Arrow in University's Bow. And this is from a, a site, an outlet called The Conversation, which is academic rigor, journalistic flair. And this author of this article is actually a white woman. And I, I kind of want to show here how, uh, again, if you ain't connecting with your African heritage, right, your origins, understand other people are. And they're not just doing it now. This article is from 2016. They're not just doing it, doing it now. They've always been doing it since they've encountered African people, right? So what we're going to do, we're going to start the show. Again, we're talking about African um, African philosophy of education, uh, something that you know um, I'm into heavily. Uh, what we're going to do, we're going to start the show officially, and we're going to get into reading these uh, this, uh, this paper and this article. The paper is pretty short, so I'm going to read the paper and the article on the other side of the intro. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Welcome to the Bitter Medicine Podcast, where it's all about black empowerment. Our show focuses on black news and entertainment, arts, science, economics, history, people, and strategies that uplift, empower, and motivate Africans within the diaspora. And now your host, whose favorite color is black, Goku. Welcome back to the Bitter Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Koku. Just want to remind you guys before we get the show rolling that this show is part of a podcast network called KWAZ Radio. The other shows on the network you are invited to tune into. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Yes, indeed. I see we got The Learning Curve. That's the revolutionary matron. From the Learning Curve podcast, she sent a chat saying, greetings, fam. Greetings to you too, matron. Good to see you, and I hope everything is well on your side, for real. Um, I want to thank anyone and everyone who tunes in to the episode tonight. If you're here live with me or in the playback, let me know. Um, you know, drop a comment. So, yeah, so we're talking African philosophy of education, a powerful arrow in universities both. So I'm going to read this 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 article from the from the conversation uh, site again their tagline is academic rigor journalistic flair and this was a uh, an article from 2016 it goes 
to understand what an African philosophy, philosophy of education is and why it's so important, consider the role that universities should play in any society. Now remember, this is a white woman writing this. She goes on to say, universities, no matter where they are, ought to be places where knowledge is internalized, questioned, and considered. Do you guys agree with that? Such knowledge should respond to a university's particular social, political, and economic context. The pursuit of such knowledge happens in a quest for human development. What would a university be if its only purpose was to produce knowledge without considering its effects on a society and its people? Mm. But it's perhaps precisely this disjuncture between what universities purport to do and what happens in society. That starts to explain why knowledge in Africa has become so misplaced. This has happened in several Arab and Muslim states where some universities have seemingly become reluctant to encourage critical learning. Knowledge produced in such universities does not attend to public concerns, whether these are political, economic, social, or cultural. So this tells you these folks know exactly what, what they're doing. African knowledge can't just be considered for some academic purpose. It must also keep in mind why and how such knowledge ought to affect society. This is why an African philosophy of education can be such a powerful tool for the continent's post-colonial universities as they work to become producers of knowledge that has a public concern. This is particularly important for African universities. The continent's uh, citizens have to be initiated into ways of being and living that emphasize human cooperation, openness to debate and discussion, and responsibility towards one another. Many of the continent's political dictatorships could be avoided if citizens were encouraged to question and disagree. Now that's where you know they're playing their little games there. They know that they they support and back these um, you know many, if not all, of these are uh, dictators. So this comes to a section called Search for Meaning. Simply put, an African philosophy of education is a way of asking questions about education in Africa. It allows education students to search for meanings that relate to their chosen field. An African philosophy of education offers a discourse to address the continent's many problems. These include famine, hunger, poverty, abuse, violence, and exclusion of the other. One of Africa's most common and major dilemmas offers a useful way to illustrate the approach I'm describing, the prevalence of military dictatorships. A student of African philosophy of education would ask how military rule affects education. How might education in turn address the restrictions of a military challenge? When the military is in charge, a country's institutions of learning are expected to toe the line. Let me read that again. When the military is in charge, a country's institutions of learning are expected to toe the line. Coercion and control are the order of the day. There is no room for dissent and democratic engagement. How, if at all, should an African university respond to a society that is under military rule? When students are taught to deliberate, to talk back to others and to listen to them, they would be serious practitioners of an African philosophy of education. Such students would not only willingly engage with others and their differences, but also be prepared to listen to dissenting views. But adopting an African philosophy of education isn't about just analyzing the continent's problems. Instead, a student will go on to emphasize how these problems could be resolved by considering education as one possible medium then they'll need to examine what both the problem and its solving might imply for education. There's a video here, um, but this video, uh, it, it, it's related, but it's about truth and reconciliation. We ain't gonna into that. Theory versus practice is the next section. As elsewhere, the idea of doing or practicing an African philosophy of education 
is connected to bridging the pseudo dichotomy between theory and practice. Some may claim that African philosophy is merely an act of theorizing. They are wrong. That it's actually embedded with an energy and drive to change undesirable situations and conditions. <clears throat> In any case, there is no separation between theory and practice. <clears throat> One cannot delink thinking from acting upon happenings in society. Any good theory on education should affect educational practices positively. What constitutes a positive theory of education? To my mind, the answer lies with practices that take shape through uh, autonomous thinking, engagement and freedom made visible through deliberation. In this manner, theory and practice are intertwined. I actually agree with that. An African philosophy of education also allows inquirers to look at how educational practices, teaching, learning, managing, and governing universities on the continent can be made to feel real. <clears throat> Sadly, it's rare for many of today's universities in Africa to teach any philosophy of education. Let me read that again. Sadly, it's rare for many of today's universities in Africa to teach any philosophy of education. Philosophy of education is wrongly perceived as being some abstract exercise of the mind that's not connected to real life issues. Africa's institutions of higher learning should seek to change this. You know, I have a friend who does, who was doing business in Africa. So she's in America. She was connecting with folks in Africa to, to create this um, incubator in Ghana. And one of the problems that they, they encountered was that, and, and this is their testimony, not mine's, that they encountered that a lot of the African folks couldn't really think outside of the box. Like they, they are programmed to, their thought processes, the steps of how they process through ideas or through situations, it's a kind of a set thing in their mind. And, and to be fair, a lot of Western education is that too, to be honest. It's memoriz it's rote memorizations, it's theories, it's it's this, that, and the, you know, it's it, it's it's things of that nature, right? But what Africa needs is people who understand the underlying concepts, theories, and put those things into active practice. Right? So based on what my friend and, and others on the continent had to deal with and trying to get this thing started. They had a big problem with, um, if you said something that was a tangential thought to what they used to, it just threw everything off. Africa's institutions of higher learning should seek to change this. Any university that wants to advance its status as a knowledge producer ought to be responsive to knowledge claims. It's here that the idea of an African philosophy of education can become so important. It's a crucial element for enhancing the autonomy and freedom associated with university teaching and learning. <clears throat> this brings us to a section of this article called Addressing Injustice. Addressing injustice. In the chat, though, I see we have daily affirmations by Pauline saying good evening. We got Dub G9. I don't remember seeing that name before, but I appreciate you coming through. Jubs, Dub G9 says, this is true. They go on. Dub G9, let me know if you're male or female, if you don't mind. They go on to say there is a gigantic problem of critical thinking out there. Right? Dub G9, are you from the continent? Have you... Have you interacted directly with the continent? Just let me know for some, some added information. So addressing injustice, the other key feature of an African philosophy of education is that it's invariably geared towards addressing the continent's injustice and inequalities. A university education that is guided by a concern for educational justice and advocacy for freedom, autonomy, 
democratic engagement. Some people will have a problem with the democratic engagement part. And responsiveness to the other is one that takes African philosophy of education seriously. Africa's concerns to move beyond its subjugation to repression and exclusion will gain considerably more momentum if its people can produce analysis and responses to the, to the legitimate concerns that confront humanity on the continent. This is allowed to happen. African philosophy of education would have acquired significant potency in its educational quest for justice. So they'll let you know what the conversation is about, nonprofit organization, depend on readers like you to help us, blah, blah, blah. You can see this was written by a white woman, Beth Daly, right? Dub G9 says they're from the U.S. in the chat and that they spent five months in Ghana. That that must have been a blessing, and, and, and Dub G9 is a, is, is a guy. So I appreciate you responding to me, Dub G9, with my little questions there. So you spent five months out there, and you you agree with what you just heard me talking about, that, um, you know, folks are... You know they know what they know, but outside of that of that stepwise process to to go through things to analyze and et cetera, they are not great with that, and that's what we need out there. That's what we need out there. Dub G nine says yes to that. He said um, those five months in Ghana changed his life. I I, I appreciate hearing about that, and thank you for coming through, Dub G nine. Dub G nine, how did you hear about um? this um, live stream tonight and this podcast in general. So while I got you here, let me read this short paper. It's a nine page paper. Let's let's read this paper that I really plan to read tonight. Yeah. It's called African Philosophy of Education, Implications for Teaching and Learning by Wai Waghid, a professor out of South Africa. The abstract reads, the article argues that one can speak of an African philosophy of education in the same way in which one refers to an Indian, Western, Chinese, or Islamic philosophy of education. An African philosophy of education is a scientific enterprise which has three constitutive aspects. Firstly, to be reasonable in one's articulations. Secondly, to demonstrate moral maturity. And thirdly, to be attuned to deliberation. In this essay, I argue that the efficacy of teaching and learning could be enhanced if framed according to these three aspects of an African philosophy of education. So before we start reading, I just want to remind you guys to, uh, you know, hit the thumbs up for me. The thumbs up really help these channels for me. Share the content with your peoples. Um, that's, that's very important. And subscribe if you haven't already. Right? If you're hearing my voice, please do those three things right now. And if you're on social media, by all means, uh, you could you could follow um, you could follow this podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. Can we talk of an African philosophy on education? The position I wish to explore in this article is that if one hopes to understand the experiences and conditions of African communities, then one firstly needs to practice a philosophy of education. Philosophy of education is an activity of scientific inquiry, which enables one to understand the situations of communities, albeit Africans, lived experiences. Hence, I argue that it is not implausible to refer to an African philosophy of education because a philosophy or philosophies of education are activities of method, of method, uh, of method, what's the word here? Um, methodical inquiry, which enable one to understand, explain, explore, question, or deconstruct the lived experiences of people. Simply put, an African philosophy of education explores the lives of African communities and their situations in the same way that an Islamic philosophy of education examines the lived experiences and conditions of Muslim communities. The point I am making is that philosophic activity is not a thing or body of knowledge which is neutral and objective, but rather a mode of intellectual inquiry, reasonable, deliberative, and moral. I like that. I like that. You see, 
we we on shoot the breeze on Saturday. We talked about this situation with the sister in North um, Nigeria, Deborah Samuels, who said something. Uh, she was a student, and she said something to some classmates that people took as a, a offense. Um, you know, people took offense to it, uh, saying that she insulted their their prophet. And that 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 terminology reminded me of the NOI back in the day with Malcolm X. Insulted their prophet. Insulted their prophet. Um, <laughs> uh, and so these people, these students, you know, murdered this, beat this woman to death. I think they stoned her to death and then threw tires on her and burnt her body and all that stuff. And, and it's a shame. But what's crazy about that is those were those are African people. So educated in the Islamic education that they killed that another African sister over some Arab deity. I mean, think about that. So, so this just shows you, number one, the importance of education, and number two, and this could be number one for me, the importance of re-Africanization. That's what we got to get. That, that's exactly what, what we have to engage in at this point. We have to re-Africanize ourselves, especially those of us outside here in the West who, 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 who grew up under colonial education systems, public fool systems, like Oni would say, and others. You know, we, we really got to work on this stuff, man. You know, um, in the chat, oh, okay. In the chat, Dub G9 says he saw the tweet about the show. I appreciate that. I mean, the tweets are doing something, and the retweets are doing something. So I, I appreciate that. Um, Daily Affirmations by Pauline says, tune in on Saturdays to Dub G9. Me and my family do because the topics are fire and spans the diaspora. You can even join in by phone or computer. Trust me. Thank you for that. Daily Affirmations by Pauline. I like that endorsement. Thank you very, very much for that. Uh, WG9 says, wonderful. I'll join when my schedule permits. I will subscribe. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, to continue, uh, any philosophy of education is in some way related to modes of thought and action which make education what it is. In the Aristotelian sense, to educate is a human action, which tells us, which tells us something about how people become knowledgeable, how they develop their capacities to understand, reflect on, and attend to achieving the quote-unquote good life. In this way, through Western philosophy of education, human beings attempt to make sense of and strive towards achieving the good life. They cooperate with one another and find common ways to interact with their environment. You see. You, you, <laughs> find common ways to interact with their environment. They cooperate with one another. That's community, by the way. And that's what we don't really have. We don't really have that, especially here in the U.S. Uh, Dub G9, you said you were in Ghana for five months. Were you on a, were you a student? Were you in a, uh, like the, uh, what do you call that thing? In the Peace Corps? Oh, you know. Just out of curiosity, right? Cooperate with one another and find common ways to interact with their environment. Now, if Flint, Michigan people had that kind of education, right? Oh, WG9 was a PhD student. Oh, that's beautiful, man. That's beautiful. That's nice, right? Now, if 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 the black folks in Flint, Michigan had an education that connected them to one another and connected them to their environment, would they still must be it has to be five, six, seven years later, would they still not have good water? Similarly, Islamic philosophy of education involves cultivating in Muslims a sense of cooperativeness whereby they relate to one another in a quest to achieve worthwhile ends. 
Most Muslims want to live peacefully and harmoniously with others in their surroundings. I, I, let, me, let, me, let me be quiet before YouTube censors this episode. Did you guys, you guys who tune in to Shoot the Breeze, did y'all see that the, the last Shoot the Breeze episode has a, has a disclaimer before you try to pull it up and watch? Uh, I, 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 I posted a still image a listener sent me to the community tab. So you guys check out the community tab as well, right? Since different philosophies of education aim to nurture in people a sense of cooperativeness, whereby they interact and share with one another, it would not be unreasonable to assume that an African philosophy of education ought to reflect on and attend to what it means for Africans to live in a way of life, to live a, a way of life compatible with their experiences on the African continent. In this regard, to avoid talking of an African philosophy of education seems to be undesirable and out of true and out of true with the existence of multiplicity of philosophies of education, which do exist. Philosophies of education do take into account the experiences of people relevant to their context, in the same way that the Chinese might have a preference for a Chinese philosophy of education. Africans share an African philosophy of education. You get that, folks? Everyone else does for self. What they do for, for their people is, is to bring up their people. The Chinese don't, don't, don't give us some Anglo-Saxon education. So why are Africans following one? This brings me to a discussion of some of the constitutive features of an African philosophy of education. So this section is called African philosophy of education in perspective, three constitutive features. In the chat, um, Dub G9, who's new here tonight, and we appreciate him being here says he conducted his research on how living in Ghana shaped health and well-being of African Americans. Is that right? Is that right? That's that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. I man, um if you're into that kind of thing, WG9, there's a link pinned to the top of the chat here on YouTube for the Discord, the Bit of Medicine Podcast Discord. And, um, you know, your research, uh, I, I'm imagining you did a thesis that was published. Your research might be dope to put up there. So if you if you do decide to join, I'm Koku, K-O-K-O-U, -K -O um, here as well as on the Discord. Uh, you, sh you can see the name up there on the screen. Um, you know, hop on in, and uh, if you want to add that to... Um, the library that we have up there. Let me know, but hop on there, shoot me a message, and we'll go from there. But that sounds interesting. I feel like I've recently heard or oh, seen a title that kind of discusses that, and maybe it was from you. I'm not sure, but that sounds real cool. Um, it sounds interesting. Um, do you live? Do you do you eat a? I'm just asking WG9, it's just out of curiosity again. Um, when you talk about health, are you talking about diet as well? And if you're talking about diet, do you maintain a Ghanaian um, diet at this point after having lived there for five uh, months? So African philosophy of education and perspective, three constitutive features. First, Weiridu, 2004. Claims in a paper entitled Prolegomena. Prolegomena is, I, I, and, I, and well, f first let me finish the thought, then I'll, 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 I'll add my note. Prolegomena to an African philosophy of education. Prolegomena simply means like an introduction. And what this is the problem I have. And I was talking to Gastem up by email the other day. Gastem up is on the, um, is on the um, Shoot the Breeze panel on Saturday nights 
8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I, I was telling Gaston about one of the problems with African philosophy, it, it, it has the same problems of European philosophy in this one aspect to me, is the average person can won't really read through African philosophy. It, it, they, they burden the reading. It's a slog. They burden the reading with, with these wordings and that is no, is unnecessary. Like, do we really need the word pro-legomena in the title of this paper? WG9 says, not since being back in America. My diet has always been mostly chicken and fish based. In America, it's a bit more difficult to maintain a Ghanaian diet. Okay. I feel you on that one. Right, and so when you and, and this guy Weridu, he has this book that I have on African philosophy. I think it's called African philosophy, and it's you know it. The average person, let me just put it like that: the average person is not going to read it. You know, I, I think that's something that we got to start thinking about too. We don't have to emulate these folks and make it and, and put um, our works behind these different barriers of entry and stuff like that. Just keep it simple so folks could really take it in. You know what I mean? But I digress. Um, so pro to an African philosophy, philosophy of education, that an African philosophy of education cannot be spoken of without considering what it means for a person to be educated. This makes sense because any philosophy of education needs to frame human action in a way that is commensurate with its underlying meanings. Wiridu argues that an educated person is one who possesses reasonable knowledge of her culture and environment and demonstrate an ability to construct and articulate defensible arguments. I actually like that um, definition. That, again, it's accessible. Anyone could read that and pick that out there, right? Do you guys in the chat, let me post it in the chat. That's what Weirdo says. Do you guys agree with that statement of what it means to be educated? Drawing from his Akan or Ghanaian tribe experiences, Weirdo points out that an educated person referred to as a WAPO in the Akan language, WAPO, is one who is refined, polished, lucid, and logical. Such an educated person is reasonable. She knows how to use appropriate proverbs and demonstrate a willingness to listen carefully to what others have to say. In this way, an African philosophy of education accentuates the importance of being reasonable. The philosophy of education accentuates, uh, 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 accentuates the importance of being reasonable the ability of people to articulate clear, logical, and defensible arguments on the one hand, and to demonstrate on the one hand, sorry, uh, and to demonstrate a willingness to listen carefully to others on the other hand. This view on what constitutes an African philosophy of education is shared by Hun Tonji, who acknowledges the importance of criticizing the views of others in the sense that higher level formulation requires that one does not passively accept the viewpoints of others or, or, or the questions that others ask themselves or ask us from their own preoccupations, a practice he refers to as conscious rationality or reasonableness. His contention is that rationality is not given in advance. It needs to be developed in a spirit of solidarity and sharing so that the germs of ignorance and poverty will be eliminated forever from planet Earth. The point he makes is that African philosophy of education is concerned with the quest to achieve reasonableness, reasonableness so that the predicament of the African experience with reference to ignorance and poverty can be solved. Ignorance and poverty can be solved. 
Okay. Uh, of course, my potential critic might claim that African philosophy of education also allows scope for an analysis and explanation of myth, folklore, and supernaturalism, all aspects of African life, which do not always seem to be commensurate with what is reasonable and logical. Talk about it. For instance, some African communities might recount their belief in supernatural spirits, which for others might not sound logical and rational, since these communities cannot come up with tangible empirical evidence to justify their beliefs. In this sense, African philosophy of education seems to be attracted to what can be perceived to be the unreasonable and illogical. Oh, and by the way, by the way, these Western educations that black folks receive in the US, in the Caribbean, South America, Central, wherever, uh, England and all that stuff. Um, those educations teach you to be just like this person that they're talking about right here, right? Where you can't relate to what to 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 the African experience because you require like the like these white folks are enemies. You you require tangible, empirical evidence to justify what's being related to. In other words, you too see a lot of what the Africans believe in as unreasonable and illogical. But here's the crazy part about that. Most of you who would say that believe in the Quran believe in the Bible that has some of the most fantastical stories you could ever hear. But an African comes and tells you something. One of the Yoruba people come and tell you something. You can't, you can't gel with that, right? You can't gel with that. Because these educations teach you to be biased towards Africa and Africans. They teach you to think that the African is just something unreasonable and illogical, but I digress. Although the validity of supernaturalism can be disputed, this does not negate the fact that sometimes African communities offer narratives of their belief, which can make the belief fall prey to the unreasonable or illogical, but this is not true of the evidence they put forward and the arguments they offer to justify its apparent existence. Although the belief itself might be questionable, this does not detract from the validity of the procedure, lucid and logical perhaps, in which the belief can be recounted. An African philosophy of education is not mainly concerned with the validity of the belief or story, but with the procedure as to how the story is narrated with lucidity and logical argumentation that will present reasons for one's views. These reasons might not appeal to the understanding of those who listen, or listeners might contest the logic of the narrations. As far as reasonableness is concerned, um, I, I believe this, this name is pronounced Ch um, Che Che. Um, maybe uh, Dub G9 could tell me um, phonetically how you pronounce this name. I believe someone told me it was Che Che. Um, che Che makes the point that African philosophical discourse is embedded in two interrelated processes, rational discourse and the application of a minimalist logic in ordinary conversations without being conversant with its formal rules. That's interesting. Although Che Che's response, uh, sorry, although Che Che recognizes the importance of rationality and logic, he does not go far in explaining what these processes entail, besides claiming that rationality is a culture dependent concept that less formal rules are required if people want to engage in conversation. By claiming that rationality is a culture-dependent concept, um, Che Che means that the way rationality is understood, for instance, in Western culture may not necessarily apply to African cultures. In other words, it would be quite possible, he contends, to find within the African past itself a rational ethos, such as an African traditional folk tales, 
which embody critical thought that might be understood differently to the notion of rationality in Western culture. And in Cheche's, I believe it's Cheche, um, notion of a culture dependent rationality can be, re can be related to a critical reevaluation of received ideas and an intellectual pursuit related to the practical problems and concerns of African society. I see we got Janelle here in the chat saying good evening. Good evening, Janelle. Thanks for coming through. Thank all of you for coming through tonight. In other words, African rationality is a critical reevaluative uh, response to the basic human problems that arise in any African society. By critical reevaluation, uh, Geche, I think it's Cheche, means the offering of insights, arguments, and conclusions relevant to the African experience by suggesting new ways, alternative ways of thought and action. If I understand Cheche correctly, then he also relates the articulation of insights, arguments, and conclusions to being critical of political authority and to cultivating self-reflection and an innovative spirit. You see, that's what we need. That's what we need, cultivating reflect, self-reflection and an innovative spirit. If I consider criticism, self-reflection and innovation, which is creativity and imagination, as touchstones of rationality, then it follows that the insights, arguments, and conclusions one offers cannot be unrelated to being critical, creative, and self-reflexive. In essence, an African philosophy of education advocates a high degree of reasonableness. So you see what, what 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 he's saying here? Basically what he just said, what he just tried to illustrate is, is what the West might see as reasonableness and they have their own dynamic and paradigm for, for how they go about what's reasonable. That doesn't necessarily or often gel with what's reasonable to Africans. And so if Africans go about learning what reasonableness from the West, reasonableness from the West, that doesn't gel with who they are and how they interact with one another and their environment, then how is the African going to handle issues between each other and the environment? How are they gonna solve problems that will arise among a people, among communities, among nations? We got Brother Bakari joining us in the chat saying peace to the host and the chat. Y'all say what's up to Brother Bakari. Don't be rude. When folks come in and say good evening, y'all can say good evening back, All right? Peace to Brother Bakari. I know that's uh, Mr. Untouchables uh, brethren, um, so I uh, peace to him. Um, yeah, so so that's what he basically explained there, and, and there's a power in that what he's explaining, man. The power in, for example, the power in using your own language, the power in using your own terminology, the power in naming your own things. There's a there's a heavy power in that. When you got to go and look up what some Greek name something, and that's what the, 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 the terminology that you're using, right? First of all, like if you break down words, right? Words tend to arise from, you know, historically words tend to arise from a people situation, right? When languages are created and, 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 and when languages are adapted from a, say a mother language, a mother tongue or whatever, the folks who are in Greece or the folks who are in Rome or the folks who are in Russia or whatever, when they're creating these languages and naming what they're naming, they're using it, they're, they're doing it from their experiences and from their peoples and their interactions. That's never going to resonate with us. I remember someone talking about this one time. Peter Tosh talked about this one time. He said, when he speaks English, he, he stutters and stuff like that. I, I used to stutter heavily as a kid. He stutters and whatnot. And 
he 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 said this thing which was interesting. He said that's because I'm not speaking my language. English is a foreign tongue. So I'm stumbling over the words. When you see they talk about our kids are not learning and have um these learning issues and this, that, and the other. Um, a lot of times that's because these kids are learning some stuff that doesn't resonate with who they are, their community, right? Their daily experiences, the way they interact with their environments, it just doesn't gel. And it, it, it's of no, it's of no real interest to them. Listen, if it doesn't relate to your people and your environment, most people don't care about it. This is the importance of, of this whole African-centered education thing, right? I see folks are saying peace to Bukhari and each other and whatnot. Thank you guys for that. You know. Second, an educated person is one who has acquired the virtues of honesty. Hold on, I think I, I jumped here. Let me fix this. Second, an educated person is one who has attained moral maturity and refinement. Such a person has acquired the virtues of honesty, faithfulness, duty, and empathy for the well-being of others in her community. Now, again, if you're sending your kids to a public school system that is not, of course, is not African-centered, where you have these Karens and whatnot, who are the teachers. Are they going to have empathy for your children? For the well-being of your children? And others, in, and, and, and other folks who are in your children's community? And right here, the next sentence. This implies that an educated person has developed a sense of responsibility towards her kin and community. If you're sending your kids towards your to your enemies to be educated, first of all, they're your enemies. That's the that's the first sign that you're fucking up. But let's just go off of let's just go. Let's just say for those of you who don't even think these folks are, are your enemy, and they are. Let's just go off of racial racial classification. You think there's this school full of white administrators and teachers and this, that, and the other? You think they're gonna care about the well-being of your children? This is why you see police in these schools roughing up kids and gir little girls and all kind of stuff, tossing them around in classrooms. This is why. Wiridu makes the claim that an individual who has not achieved a sense of morality, which these other folks don't have, responsibility and empathy towards others, has not achieved personhood or the status of an educated person. This makes an African philosophy of education a highly moral discourse aimed at cultivating honesty, sincerity, responsibility, and empathy towards others. Such a view of philosophy of education finds expression in the ideas of Dewey, who argues that the achievement of moral maturity is important in the making of an educated person. So Dewey is a white boy. Uh, you know, the Dewey decimal system. Um, I think he, I think he played a role in that. He was a, he is a person. I, I, I read a paper maybe two years back um, talking about Booker, Booker T. Washington and what Booker T. did with education and how this particular paper I was reading, you guys can go back and look up this um, this episode. It's a, it's a good read. It's a good read and good discussion. Um, people always talk about Dewey and what Dewey did for education, right? Um, I believe I believe he's involved in the Dewey Decimal System. Don't quote me on that. But I believe so. Um, people always talk about what Dewey did for education, but they don't talk about, and for obvious reasons, they don't talk about what Booker T did. Remember the article I read just before I started reading this paper here? Booker T was the guy who first showed people really and truly pract theory and practice are not different.
your children can be practicing as they're learning the theory. And people, that paper that I was reading, I forgot the title of the paper, which is also the title of the episode. But you guys go back and just just search Booker T. Washington and listen to some of those episodes, and you will see how Booker T. was even greater than this white guy that people like to prop up in terms of, of changing how education is done. And again, the thing about our, our people as Africans, as Black people, as African people, these other groups tend to come and take our ideas, and it's not a new thing. This ain't something that's happening now. This has been happening. They take our, our, our ideas and they better their people. Just like they used um, some of our ancestral mothers to raise their children. But we ain't doing it though. We ain't taking the ideas and making it happen for ourselves. It's, it's madness. What follows from this is that an African philosophy of education demonstrates the potential to promote justice, courage, and truthfulness in individuals. That is, goods or excellences internal to achieving moral maturity and refinement. In other words, African philosophy of education aims to contribute to the transformation of educational discourse in Africa, in particular empowering communities to participate in their own educational development since the empowerment of communities as well as the educational development could be achieved through the use of whatever intellectual skills, rational or rational and logical, they possess to eliminate the various dimensions of the African predicament. That is, the amelioration of the human condition, which is a consequence of poverty, hunger, famine, unemployment, political oppression, civil wars, colonialism, which is imperialism, and economic exploitation a matter of achieving moral goods internal to the life experiences of Africans. Thirdly, an educated person is given to dialogue. Thirdly, an educated person is given to dialogue. Um, um, Huntanji relates an understanding of African philosophy of education to progressive structures of dialogue and argument without which no science, that is African philosophy of education, is possible. In my view, these structures of dialogue and argument are constitutive of what an African philosophy of education as a social practice is about. Any discussion that does not address these structures of dialogue and, and argumentation does not do justice to what constitutes an African philosophy of education. But before I explore some of the goods internal to consensual dialogue, I first need to take issue with um, Hontanji, whose call for African philosophy to be connected to structures of dialogue and argument seems to have a paradoxical relationship to his critique of ethno-philosophy. Now, if one considers that ethno-philosophy, which takes into account the narratives and life experiences of Africans, and structures of dialogue and argumentation invariably involve listening to the voices of others, no matter how ill-informed, then it follows that structures of dialogue and argumentation cannot simply dismiss oral tradition and cultural narratives, unless Huntanji assumes that structures of dialogue and argumentation refer only to offering persuasive arguments through a rational articulation of points of view. But then, Rational argumentation and persuasion are not necessarily related to eloquence and philosophical justification alone. To my mind, listening to what the other has to say, even though, his, even though this expression may be unimportant or inarticulate justifications, allows the voices of people who would otherwise have been muted or marginalized to come to the fore. For instance, listening to the view of an African sage in the Ovambu language, or his followers in conversation should not necessarily imply that because such a view is perhaps not eloquently expressed, it ought to be dismissed as irrelevant to the dialogue. What makes dialogue a conversation is that people are willing to listen to what they have to say to one another without putting any participants down or dismissing their subjective views 
that's not worthy of consideration. A dialogue becomes a legitimate conversation when points of view are expressed in a way that allows the other to offer his or her rejoinder, no matter how ill-informed. This means that Kontonji's critique of ethno-philosophy does not hold water since it reflects the moral standpoints and cultural justifications of people whose exclusion from dialogue would nullify legitimate conversation amongst people. Muntanji himself values the importance of listening to others as an advantage of facilitating dialogue and moderating, on occasion, the excessive passion of the most aggressive opponents. This is perhaps why he claims that his critique of ethno-philosophy and rejection of collective thought through dialogue were a bit excessive. If one assumes that ethno-philosophy is considered by many African communities as compromising a body of knowledge, which is myths, folklores, customs, culture, and tradition, which determines how philosophy ought to be practiced, which I suspect Huntanji might be doing, then I agree with his rejection of it as African philosophy. This is because ethno-philosophy is treated as some objective neutral truth, which cannot be questioned and undermined, thus making ethno-philosophy some universal thing which should be valorized as scientific inquiry. However, any philosophy of education refers to an activity which uses methods of inquiry such as analysis, synthesis, deconstruction, questioning, examination, exploration, and exegesis to investigate a phenomenon, in this case, educational issues related to the African lived experience on the African continent. This makes African philosophy of education, method, uh, methodically speaking, a mode of scientific inquiry and not, a, not an objective body of truth as ethno philosophy seems to be depicted. So why am I reading this paper too, by the way? Why are we reading this paper, why are you listening to what I'm talking about? Because, as I stated earlier before, we have a, a, a problem of self-determination. And the thing that's going to get us out of this problem is we need to be educated, but not just any old education, right? I see uh, Bobby Wright is here saying Habri Ghani. We need an education that's suited for us, that's created by us. So this is why we're reading it. You guys who are listening, you might not all be educators. In fact, none of you might be educators formally, but you are in charge of the youth who are around you. I saw a tweet today. Um I'm not going to pull it up on screen, but I saw a tweet today where a woman said something like, my grandchild, who's 13, just asked me, quote, why do they hate us so much? And I, I believe it was referring to, you know, it, it was compelled by recent events in Buffalo where black folks were gunned down by a white supremacists or white nationalists out there. And only to say from the pro-black perspective, another podcast on KWAZ radio, only to say responded and retweeted it and said, what did you, what did you tell them? Because it's your job, I'm paraphrasing, but it's your job to educate those youth. And that's the same thing for all of you who are listening to my voice and me as well. It's our jobs to educate these kids. And I, I tend to give way to, I understand that everyone's not going to be able to do it. Um, if you can create collectives around you um, and send your children to, to some folks in the, in, in the community, so to speak, do that. If you can get them to an African-centered school, do that. If you can't, you got to find different ways. You got to do something yourself in the home. And so the reason why I read papers like this is because I want you guys to understand 
you as the adults in the room to understand that you have a responsibility as well. And when we read stuff like this, it's supposed to start getting you thinking about what is it that needs to be done and how are we going to go about doing this. I just want to explain why we're reading this. I see we got Athraza in the room, so it's just joining in. Thank you for coming through. Either way, I appreciate it. All right, make sure you guys all hit the like button for me, please. All right, let me continue with the paper. In this regard, Higgs, 2003, does not depict African philosophy of education as, a, as an activity which involves intellectual inquiry that can contribute to the transformation of educational discourse in South Africa. He claims that African philosophy of education ought to empower communities to participate in their own educational development since it, quote, respects diversity, acknowledges lived experiences, and challenges the hegemony of Western Eurocentric forms of universal knowledge. That's what I'm talking about. His articulation of an African philosophy of education seems to ignore the sentiments of Oladipo, on whom he draws largely for his ideas of an African philosophy of education. Oladipo suggests that the empowerment of communities as well as their educational development could be achieved through the use of whatever intellectual skills they possess to eliminate the various dimensions of the African predicament. That is the amelioration of the human condition as a consequence of poverty, hunger, famine, unemployment, political oppression, civil wars, colonialism, which is imperialism, and economic exploitation. The point I'm making is that Oladipo views African philosophy of education as intellectual skills which have to be used methodically in addressing the African predicament. Philosophy of education is an activity and not some objective truth which needs to be achieved. Central to Higgs's argument in defense of a form of human activism which could ameliorate the disempowered African condition is the notion of Ubuntu or humanness. Ubuntu is a form of humanism which could engender communal embeddedness and connectedness of a person to other persons. Higgs said that in 2003. Such an understanding of Ubuntu. By the way, how many of you have heard of Ubuntu. I know I've talked about it many times in the past. Um, and how many of you practice it in your localities? So this is the thing too. This is the this is the other thing too. One of the reasons why I talk about African centered education is that you're gonna have some work to do before you can go back to that continent. This notion that you're just gonna that everyone's just gonna pick up and go back and, and or, or everyone who's worthy in the sense of Gavi um, to go back, you're going to go back without an understanding of the people that you're going to try to go and integrate with. You got to do the work first. You have to re-Africanize yourself first. You have to understand the general principles that they live by. Or else you know what's going to happen? Go look up the history of Liberia. You understand? Go look up the history of Liberia. You have to, you have to become <clears throat> wholly African. And, and so education needs to be a big part of it. What worries me about Higgs' view on African philosophy of education is his scanty treatment of philosophy of education as an activity. I did not encounter references in his ideas to what constitutes an African philosophy of education, which, which explained the activity as another way of scientific inquiry. Ubuntu is certainly an African lived experience, which can be analyzed and explained or deconstructed methodically, that is, using this methods of philosophy of education. However, Ubuntu itself cannot be valorized to the level of philosophic activity, an idea Higgs seems to overlook. This brings us to a section called Implications of an African Philosophy of Education 
for teaching and learning. So this is this should be um, this is this should be interesting for all of you. What I want to do is I want to remind you guys that this show, the Bitter Medicine Podcast, is part of a podcast network. And there are other shows on the network you guys should be tuning into. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. This is D Webb with the Harsh Reality Podcast. Ask you to tune in where we tackle the news of the day that affects our community only on KWAZ Radio. Peace, family. This is Oni inviting you to listen to the pro black perspective where black problems are addressed with black solutions. Greetings, fam. Tune in to The Learning Curve with me, the revolutionary matron on KWAZ Radio. You are listening to the Bitter Medicine Podcast on KWAZ Radio. Have you ever considered joining KWAZ Radio? Each of our hosts shares their unique perspective with you. You might have a perspective that needs to be shared. If that's true, hit us up at kwaz.radio at gmail.com. What are you going to do? What you going to do? Yes, indeed. What are you going to do? Uh, in the chat, Bobby Wright says the community concept of working together for the common good. That's Ubuntu to, uh, to Bobby E. Wright. And here's the thing about that, Ubuntu. Right? We're not doing that now. We're, wherever, wherever we are, we're not doing that now. And I'm not saying that the continent is doing a great job with it now either. We're not doing it because they also need to have a re-Africanization process too, by the way. That's a conversation that no one's really bringing up. But they also need it as well, right? Um, But we're not doing that where we are. So how are you going to lift these millions of people from the West within the diaspora to go home and help Africa fix its problems when you don't even know how to work together where you are in Alabama, or where you are in New York, or where you are in Florida, or where you are in Michigan, or where, where you are in the UK or the Caribbean. We have to get these things working. We have to be working on this stuff now. Let's go to this section and finish the paper. Implications of an African philosophy of education for teaching and learning. African philosophy of education with its emphasis on achieving reasonableness, would be inclined towards an approach to teaching and learning whereby students, for instance, abandon the expectation that prescribed texts and course readings be considered as master texts. Students are regarded instead as reasonable people, which means they become more open to interpreting, analyzing, and looking beyond texts. They become less likely to insist on final and certain conclusions and are more able to, to, to deliberate with other students and teachers. This, of course, requires first that teachers develop a well-attuned ear for the responsive capabilities of students. They become reasonable themselves. And secondly, that they refine their range of communicative capabilities in order to elicit student responses and to nurture them to become self-critical and deliberative what I just read, we all could do that with the youth, the children around us. But you see what it says. You have to prepare yourself first. It's all about preparation. Moreover, when teachers and students reason together, they give to one another an intelligible account of their reasoning, showing their ability and their willingness to evaluate the reasons for action advanced to one by others so that they make themselves accountable for their endorsements of the practical conclusions of others as well as for their own conclusions. 
as far as teaching educational theory to, to, to university students is concerned. University teachers may cultivate in postgraduate education students in postgraduate education students an understanding of critical pedagogy and, ref and reflexivity so that they in turn can critically and self-reflectively evaluate such concepts. Students can evaluate university teachers' ex explications of education concepts by recognizing the logical soundness, clarity, and coherence of arguments producing justification of these concepts and may decide to relate these concepts to their educative practices. The point is that socializing students in education concepts no longer revolves around the decisions that individual university teachers make, but also around the evaluation of teachers by students who may decide to use concepts such as critical pedagogy and reflexivity in their educative practices. In other words, this guy likes to say in other words a lot, by the way. In other words, students may decide to do something with these concepts. These students might decide to experience what it would mean if these concepts were to be used in action. For instance, some students might want to experience how other students would engage with them if they question and challenge one another's views on, for instance, educational transformation. Dewey refers to this kind of uh, pedagogical activity as students and teachers engaging in a transaction. Consequently, the action performed by an individual university teacher constitutes part of some whole so that by their performance, the whole is brought into being. You know what's weird about the, this paper in the sense? This guy is talking about this white guy, this European guy, Dewey, a lot, right? But, and you know, I, I, I admit that he is talking about, like, African scholars as well, but why even bring up Dewey, right? Why even bring him up? We know what Western education is. Right. Anyway, university teachers act in the classroom while at the same time opportunities are created for students to experience the transaction. They are not excluded from pedagogical activity. Dewey, again, explains experience as a university classroom practice that leads to patterns of action, which constitute the basis of organic learning. You see, what should have been, instead of using Dewey, this guy should have been using Booker T. You see? What Booker T did, by the way, if you're not familiar, it's, it's a fascinating type of thing. In his time, his vision is fascinating. You, 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 if you're into, if you're into, into educating our youth, if you understand why it's important and, and, and if you're into it, you got to study what Booker T did. To continue. Second, as teachers, we act together with our students to the extent that we expect to learn with and from them, and we feel less threatened by occasions in which we sometimes need to admit that we do not know or understand everything. In this way, teaching itself is a form of learning. Teaching itself is a form of learning anew with other students, where the teacher acts as listener, questioner, instructor, guide, and responsible and caring leader. Teachers show a sense of moral maturity and refinement. Again, I ask the question, do you get that? When you send a black kid to a school dominated by, by, by Europeans and, and other, you know, Europeans and Asians, right? Do you get that? Does that, does that black child get that? I'll let you guys answer that question, right? Only then will our students not be hesitant to make mistakes or to offer reasons which might at times appear muddled or confusing. Through our actions, we accept as conditional that our classroom practices are meant to explore and construct and to make allowance for erring. In this regard, I agree with uh, Berbulis who makes the point that our attitudes as teachers should include accepting as a condition of exploration and discovery the occasional state of being lost, confused, 
and unsettled. When I teach, I teach microbiology. When I teach and I ask a question and the class is quiet, but I could see there's some hesitancy in a couple of students. And sometimes students will say, uh, this might be a, a stupid answer, but, uh, and I'm like, listen, there's no, especially when I'm dealing with black students, there's no, there's no uh, dumb answer. There's no stupid answers. Either you're correct or you're incorrect. And I'm going to show you the error that you're making if you're incorrect. You see what I'm saying? But again, when your kid is in a, especially, especially a science class, when your kid, when your black child is in a science class, let's say, let's say chemistry, physics, or something like that, right? You think that Eurasian is going to handle them in the manner that I just described? To try to encourage them, to tell them, hey, don't worry about no stupid answer. Either you're correct or incorrect. And if you're incorrect, I'm going to show you where you're making your error. Who's more likely to do that? That Eurasian teacher in the school or you and others like you in your community, which goes back to my um, statement of creating cooperative education or communal education or something in your communities. We got KW Don 7 here. KW Don 7 says, Sour Bono. Peace to KW Don 7, man. Appreciate that, brother. Right? Only then will our students not be hesitant to make mistakes or to offer reasons which might at times appear muddled or confusing. Through our actions, we accept as conditional that our classroom practices are meant to explore and construct and to make allowance for, for errors. In this regard, I agree with um, Burbulez, who makes the point that our attitudes as teachers should include accepting as a condition of exploration and discovery the occasional state of being lost, confused, and unsettled. I know I, I reread that. Moreover, when students and teachers care, they respect one another. Moreover, when students and teachers care, they respect one another. Why is respect a condition for deliberative pedagogical activity? In seeking to, hold on, in seeking to achieve respect, for instance, in the face of disagreement, we need to attend to the way people hold or express positions. For example, the way in which university teachers should treat each other with regard to policy issues, even when the policy debate ends in legislation and a university takes a position favoring one side of the dispute, needs to be grounded in principles constituting mutual respect. In other words, he likes to say, in other words, a lot too. Uh, respect is a form of agreeing to disagree which of course requires a favorable attitude and constructive interaction with the persons with whom one disagrees. Respect should not merely be an unconditional acceptance of everything people say or propose. Now, let me say something. Growing up in the Caribbean, there was a notion that th this was an actual notion, that you must give your elders respect Right. And like it said here, right, it, it was held as this like this unconditional, this acceptance of everything that was said or proposed. This person was was older than you. You just have to respect it. They could be talking and oftentimes a lot of these folks was talking nonsense But this is what we're taught and that's wrong. That's wrong. Respect should not merely be an unconditional acceptance of everything people say or propose. People should be able to agree to disagree. We got Dorico Cooper photography in the room. Dorico, how are you tonight? Dorico always sends me these stock tips, which I follow. Um, so I appreciate that, brother, too. 
right? University teachers do not show respect for students by simply accepting everything they say. Students do not show respect for university teachers merely by imitating them. Respect demands that we hold others to the intellectual and moral standards we apply to ourselves. Excusing others from the demands of intellectual rigor and honesty or moral sensitivity and wisdom on the grounds that everyone is entitled to his or her opinion, no matter how ill-informed or ungrounded it is to treat them with contempt. We honor others by challenging them when we think they are wrong and by thoughtfully taking into consideration their justifiable criticisms of us. To do so is to take them seriously. To do any less is to dismiss them as unworthy of serious consideration, which is to say, to treat them with disrespect. That's one of the things I like about the shoot the breeze on Saturday nights. We're not all in agreement all the time. In fact, it's common for us to not all be in agreement. But there's a respect that sometimes I want to keep um, central to those discussions is that there's a respect. We can agree to disagree. But having the discourse is what's important. Because in, in having the discourse publicly in the way that we do on, on, on Saturday Night's live stream, it allows folks who are in the chat room, right? It allows folks in the chat room to mull over what we're talking about on the panel and to give their own um, view or views on certain topics. And that allows us to have even more discourse on, on, on said topic. And that's a good thing. That's iron sharpening iron, right? Rico Cooper says, wow, this paper is on point. I appreciate that you enjoyed the paper. If you guys, have, if, besides Dorico, if you guys are enjoying the paper, drop a one for me. If you dislike the paper, drop a two. I won't be offended if you dislike it. That will lead to potential discussion, right? And if you guys ever want these papers, um, if you don't know how to find them or whatever, um, if you're on the Discord or you join the Discord, just hit me up. Send me a DM. I'll gladly send you the paper, right? Um, we honor others by challenging them when we think they are wrong and by thoughtfully taking into consideration their justifiable criticisms of us. To do so is to take them seriously. To do any less is to dismiss them as unworthy of serious consideration, which is to say to treat them with disrespect. Thus, if university teachers, for example, prevent students from exercising critical reflection and imagination regarding educational issues, or if students are unable to give critical evaluations of such matters, their actions should not be regarded as beyond the pale of critical judgment. Respect does, does also not mean that everything students do is fine, such as when they express incoherent and unjustifiable points of view. And that's a great point, right? I, I, I gave you what I do in the class, but that's not the, that's not the full picture of what I do. There's times if you if you come with something super silly or something where you clearly didn't prepare and you're just talking to talk, yeah, I'm going to tell you about that. Right? I'm going to tell you about that. You know, I see we got um, Daily Affirmations by Pauline still here. Bobby E. Wright is still here. They dropped a one for me. I appreciate you guys for that. Right? Respect means that students should be held accountable in supporting and implementing educational issues, for instance, critical pedagogy on the basis of self-reflection. This implies that respect does not simply mean acceptance of self-reflection. Uh, did I jump this now? This implies does not mean acceptance of everything students do, sorry. Respect conceived as mere acceptance of everything students do or say negates the value of the process of deliberation. Third, deliberative university classroom activity, what um, Hontonji refers to as structures of dialogue and argumentation, provides possibilities which can be used as instruments for making teaching and learning more desirable. Why? In the first instance, deliberation demands that teachers and students do not merely accept given, given educational problem definitions, 
with predetermined ends which need to be instrumentally engineered and controlled. Through deliberation, university teachers and students should approach educational problem solving by offering possibilities as to what is achievable and whether achieving it is desirable. I actually like that, right? Through deliberation, university teachers and students should approach educational problem solving by offering possibilities as to what is achievable and whether achieving it is desirable. I actually like that. It is quite possible to pursue this line of educational problem solving because deliberation creates possibilities for university teachers and students to come up with alternative possibilities for desirable actions. Y'all feel me on that one? I, do you understand what the author is saying there? Like, when Booker T. Washington was, was, was um, creating Tuskegee, one of the things he would do is he would have his students build some of the buildings, right? But what he did was he allowed the older students to teach the younger students. And what he also did was he allowed the different aspects of, of building, right? He allowed the carpenters to be around the masons, for example. And they would stand up there and they would look at this, 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 this problem, which was we need a building. And they'll stand together and they'll reason out and deliberate about the cost of materials. How should we go about um, the construction? This, that, and the other. And before you knew it, there was guys, there was kids who were learning how to be businessmen as well, because in those deliberations, they were talking about the, uh, the cost of this kind of labor in the real world. They were talking about the cost of the materials. They were coming up with alternative ways of going about the work because they realized in their discussions what was achievable, right? And, and, and whether or not if, if achieving it was desirable, they had those discussions and those deliberations. I mean, real, I mean, we really got to get back to that stuff. We really have to get back to that stuff, right? Educational problems are not solved in advance. Rather, through deliberation, possible solutions are imagined, contested, and experimented with. For this reason, Ramsden, 1992, claims that university education should lead students to the, imagi the imaginative acquisition of knowledge, which would not only encourage them to think critically, but also to stretch their creative capacities in relation to others to the point at which they can change ideas. In other words, take a drink anytime um, in other words comes up. In other words, solutions to educational problems are imaginatively and deliberatively constructed, which involves the use of both teachers and students' imaginative powers and creative, and creative judgments to come up with ends not previously negotiated. These ends grow out of the, the deliberative teacher-student pedagogical activity. In essence, our deliberative actions and our teaching learning encounters should also make us open to the unexpected, the uncertain, and the unpredictable. In this way, our teaching learning encounters cultivate a kind of deliberation without any preconceived endpoint or finality in mind. This attitude invariably leads to new pathways, new perspectives, and new discoveries about what constitutes education and our different understandings of it. You know, as I read that, it makes me think about the scientific method. The scientific method is a six-step process of how to go about studying a phenomenon. And it's a it's it's really a a Eurasian type mindset that you go through these precise steps, right? And, it's, and the, the steps are general. What you do within the steps, they, they there are some rules and parameters like uh, how you deal with variables, independent variables, controlled variables, etc. But 
what what's missing from that oftentimes is this same deliberation that they're talking about in this paper here where you know i'm an individual you guys are individuals we we discuss this phenomenon we do works to to study it we do experimentations to study this phenomenon but the experimentations take on our own individual you know creativity our own understanding of it right um and then we 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 communicate these ideas to one another we 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 glean new ideas and new understandings from one another it's just it's just a better process and what's crazy what's crazy because i do this hr consulting so what's crazy is that nowadays there's this big there's this big push by these eurasian companies to have quote unquote diversity and inclusion because they not, they've in the last say 10 15 years they've really realized quote unquote that diversity of thought is what helps you to problem solve better is that is the same deliberation that's going on here uh, in this paper right they're catching up to this idea or maybe they always knew that that's what it was but they had this predestined fashion of going about problem solving and we as africans don't have to follow that in fact it's in our best interest not to we're supposed to come up with our own methodologies based on who we are and who we've always been right in this article i explored three interrelated constitutive elements of an african philosophy of education reasonableness moral maturity and deliberative dialogue. These features of African philosophy of education demonstrate its potential to enhance the efficacy of teaching and learning in university classrooms. And then that's the end of the paper. These are the references. Yeah, so he's talking about John Dewey, right? Um, this is what you guys need to be doing. <coughs> with um, the youth around you, man. Uh, and, and again, iron sharpens iron. These kids, if you allow them to express themselves, right, you allow them to explore ideas in their way, but be able to, to, to freely talk about it with you, and you learning from them and they learning from you, you, you will see a difference, right? you will see a huge difference in our situation. I want to thank you guys for tuning in tonight. Um, hold on a second here. I want to thank you guys for tuning in tonight. Um, I hope the paper, I know some people typed one earlier. I really hope the paper strikes a chord with you guys. I hope that you guys in turn start having conversations about some of the stuff that you hear, like in, in papers like these. I want to thank everyone who was here tonight, too. Let me go through personally. Bobby Wright was here. Daily Affirmations by Pauline was here. Make sure to check out her channel. Support her, um, her, her, her new book as well. Um, Dorico Kupu Photography is here. Make sure to check his work out as well. Uh, KW Don 7 was here. Ath Reserve was here. Dub G9 was here. I hope that brother comes back again in the future. Um, Bakari, brother Bakari was here. Hope he comes back as well. And I thank him for being here. The Learning Curve was here. That's the Revolutionary Matron. I think I got everyone. Oh, Janelle was here as well. I think I got everyone who was here. Thank you guys for tuning in. We will be back Saturday for Shoot the Breeze. Um, Make sure you guys um, check out the last episode. If YouTube is telling you, if, if YouTube is giving a, 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 a disclaimer saying that they listened and they feel like it might be sensitive or offensive or whatever, then you need to be listening, right? Whatever these folks put, put those labels, I mean, it's something that we need to hear. So you guys should tune into those discussions. Join us live Saturday, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um, 
for the next episode of um, Saturday Night Shoot the Breeze. And until then, guys, I'll see you guys later. You guys be good. Peace. Uh, yeah. Thanks for listening to the Beta Medicine Podcast with your host, Koku. If you like what you just heard, we hope you pass along our web address, betamedicineblogs.com, to your friends and colleagues, and share our show to all your social media. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a KWAZ radio production. Join us next time for another session of the Beta Medicine Podcast. Follow us on Facebook at Beta Medicine Show, Twitter, Beta Meds, Tumblr, Beta Meds, Instagram, Beta Medicine.